How can faith and reason work together? Are they somehow mutually exclusive? What role do facts and evidence play in the Christian faith? This is Reasonable Faith, Conversations with Dr. William Lane Craig. I'm Kevin Harris, and today we're discussing Dr. Craig's book, Reasonable Faith. Now, I want to remind you as we begin this conversation that there are many resources like this podcast available at reasonablefaith.org. Dr. Craig, the name of this program is Reasonable Faith, and you're well known for a book called Reasonable Faith. That book is very provocative, the title there, because a lot of people think that faith and reason are mutually exclusive. They see that as an oxymoron. Right. Well, that's part of the reason I think we picked the title, was we wanted to put something out that would be provocative, that would show that faith is a rational thing to do and that therefore there's no contradiction between faith and reason. The faith and reason debate has been going on for a long time. This is nothing new. Uh, It stretches all the way back to early thinkers. Augustine, what did he say about it? Well, Augustine had a, a sort of authoritarian view of faith and reason. He thought that faith precedes reason and that faith is based upon authority. He said, I would not believe if it were not for the authority of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And so for Augustine, basically, the foundation for faith is authority. And then you reason about that, having come to believe what you believe. That's maybe strange to Protestant ears, Mm -hmm. perhaps in today's evangelicalism or Protestantism, that kind of authority. We would uh, hold more to perhaps the authority of the Word of God. Well, exactly. And in, in other words, it's not a difference necessarily. There can be Protestant forms of authoritarianism, but generally the authority will not be the church, it'll be the scriptures. So there are certain modern theologians like Karl Barth, for example, or even a Cornelius Van Til, who are really authoritarians. They would say the basis for faith is simply the authoritative word of God, which demands obedience and which cannot be questioned. And so the basic approach to knowledge is still the same. It's authoritarianism, but you just have a different authority. And that, of course, raises one of the difficult problems with authoritarianism is how do you know which authority to believe? How do you know which authority is the true authority? It would certainly make it rather vulnerable to criticism, I think. Well, how do you know your authority is a, is authoritative and so on? I do want to get to a definition of faith and a definition of reason. Hmm. Uh, but Augustine also said something that he's rather famous for, and that is faith-seeking understanding. What do you think he meant by that? Well, again, I think that that speaks of the priority of faith, that first you believe and then you seek to understand what you believe. So it's not a matter that first you seek to understand and then you believe as a result, but it is first belief and then you try to unfold that through rational reflection and so forth. And there's, of course, huge debate on which of these has priority. Does faith precede reason or reason precede faith? And uh, Augustine wasn't altogether clear about exactly how you put this whole package together. Yeah, because he was he seemed to engage reason a lot, but then he also engaged his faith. Exactly. He he was authoritarian in terms of saying that you first believe and then you then you reason about it. But he also recognized that you have to figure out whom to believe and that that will be a search that does involve reason at the same time as you look at the different competing authorities. So his view isn't altogether clear um, as to how this is going to work its way out. Let's get a good uh, definition of faith then. What do we mean by faith? Well, the way I understand faith, Kevin, is that it is a trust or a commitment in something. I don't think that faith is a way of knowing something. And I think this is a fundamental mistake that a lot of people make. They think reason takes us so far, and then faith makes the leap that bridges the remaining gap, however that might be. And so the way you come to know something is through faith. That's not the way I understand faith in the New Testament sense. As I understand faith, you could know something to be true, and yet still not have faith in it. The scriptures say that the demons believe that God exists, and they tremble. Why? Well, because they don't have saving faith in him. So I don't think that faith is a way of knowing. I don't think that faith is something that's incompatible with knowledge. 
you can know something to be true and still face the decision, am I going to have faith, that is to say trust or commitment in this thing that I know to be true. I've heard theologians say that faith is not a way of knowing something. Faith is what you do with what you know. Yeah. yeah. That might work. Does that work as a definition? It's, well, I think so. Uh, it's a commitment to something that you hold as true. I think that that's the best way that it should be done. Now, in, in some cases, I think people could trust or place it, their commitment in something that they don't know to be true, but maybe they hope is true or they have an idea might be true. And so they're willing to make that commitment or trust, even though they don't know it. But at least I think we want to say that faith is not in any way incompatible with knowledge, that faith can be trusting in something I know to be true. And in a sense, that's what you were saying. And that's opposite of what Mark Twain said, it seems. Right. Faith is the believing in what you know ain't true. Right, exactly. <laughs> that Faith is for people who know it ain't true, but you believe it anyway. That is, I think, a very popular conception of religious belief in our culture. Bill, it seems to be maybe some nuances. Maybe you have a scale of faith. It seems on Mm. one end you've got blind faith, and on the other end you've got reasonable faith. Mm. Some things take more faith than than others. Well, I think the definition is the same, namely trust or commitment. But you're very right, I think, Kevin, in saying that that trust or commitment can be made on very different grounds As you say, one could be a blind faith where, oh, imagine you're hiking in the Alps and you see a a mountain thunderstorm arising and you realize you've got to get off that mountain. You've got to get off quickly and you don't know, say, the way down and you come to a fork. You may just have to decide blindly which fork to take and just trust that this is the path that will lead you to safety, even though you don't know. That would be an example of blind faith. But. An example of reasonable faith would be where you have some indication that this is the truth, that there's some pointers that say this is the way, uh, and some testimony perhaps saying that this is the way. And then you could have a faith that is based upon absolute certainty where, say, you you see that this leads down the mountain and it, it's right there in front of you. You still are trusting in this path to take you to the right destination, even though you know that it will. So once we think of faith in those terms, we can see there are all kinds of different grounds for faith that might be made. And I think the faith itself comes in degrees. I think that is something else that you pointed out, that some people's faith can be weak, other people's faith could be very strong, and our faith can waver at times. So faith comes in degrees as well. Well, it would take more faith for me to get on an airplane if there was smoke coming out of the, the tail and one of the wings are broken off. It'd take a lot of faith to get on that plane, but it wouldn't take as much faith. It wouldn't take much faith at all to get on a, a healthy looking uh, plane because the odds are very much in your favor. And we have a history of the airlines that would support you placing your faith in there. Take a lot of faith to get on a busted up looking airplane. I suppose it would be more of a a blind faith in that case that, that you were talking about. Well, if faith is trust, assent, it's a commitment, then something is true, what would reason be? Well, the way I understand or use the word reason, particularly in the book Reasonable Faith, is what I'm talking about is argument and evidence for a conclusion um, so that you have good reasons to believe the conclusion is true. That's what I mean. Arguments and evidence for some conclusion. By the way, the book Reasonable Faith has been out for some time and uh, you're doing the third revision on it. That's right. Almost 25 years now that this book has been in print and uh, Crossway uh, asked me to do the uh, third edition of it. And so one of the projects that I was recently involved in was going through the whole thing again, revising it, updating it, expanding it in preparation for that third edition. There seems to be a contrast also in your book of seeing something is true versus believing something is true. I guess if we were to see that something was true, we would uh, empirically verify it, maybe see it with our eyes. But believing may not involve the optical nerve. Well, this is a, a distinction that, again, you find in Augustine and in Aquinas, where, again, I think you have this kind of opposition between knowing and believing, that if you see something to be true, then you don't need to believe it is true. 
And that's the kind of opposition that I'm opposing. I, I think that you can see that something is true and yet still confront the crisis of, am I going to trust in this? Am I, am I going to commit myself to it? So I don't see that this distinction between seeing and believing is, is a good one, although it's one that's found in classical authors like Aquinas. 